They say that all artists must suffer for their profession at one time or another. But is it fair that others should suffer too? Well, my dear friends, it's once again time to sit back and relax with your favourite drink. And listen. The gala had been well attended thanks to the efforts of his longtime friend Joseph. He considered Joseph only a bit pretentious, and when he'd so generously offered William the use of his art gallery on Julia Street as the venue for his much anticipated re entry into the New Orleans art scene, William gratefully, if not graciously, accepted. Joseph had indeed been a good friend, more like a brother but William had the distinct feeling that this would be the last time his friend would bail him out. The last time Joseph would take it upon himself to promote his work, unless it was well received and, of course, financially lucrative. At one time, not that long ago, a new show by William Bacchus would have been crowded with eager buyers. Joseph would have seen a hefty commission from the sale of his friend's works, and William would have experienced a substantial increase in income as well as an inflated ego. One thing that William had never lacked was a healthy ego. Well, that was up until the evening of his new show at the gallery on Julia Street. It was a cool spring evening, and the three-room venue was crowded with throngs of New Orleans's patrons of the arts. The energy in the gallery was palpable, heavy with anticipation and expectation. Would-be buyers, wine glass in hand, stared intently at each painting and then moved on to another. The excitement began to chill. One could perceive the disappointment of the crowd, although the fake smiles did not betray their dismay, their dashed hopes of finding a new Bacchus painting for the wall of their uptown dining room. Well, the atmosphere in the gallery became almost embarrassing, and the smiling women, clutching the arms of their much older husbands, made their way to the doors and disappeared into the New Orleans night, no doubt to lament the fall of yet another promising artist. The gallery emptied. The walls echoed with sudden silence, the unsold painting screaming the disastrous failure of the evening. Not one painting sold. Not one. William had overheard the chatter. Flat! The older lady with thick, caked-on makeup and artificial breasts had lamented. Oh, so one-dimensional, another equipped. Oh, what a shame, the handsome gay man had sighed. William was one of the many who departed the show early, trying not to be noticed as he slinked out the double-glass doors onto Julia Street. He headed for the nearest bar. He had forty dollars in his wallet, that should be enough for two or three drinks in the trendy warehouse district of New Orleans. He sat, shoulders hunched, at the end of the bar, nursing a Bloody Mary garnished with a ridiculous amount of vegetables. He recognized, with his usual sardonic wit, that the damn vegetables took up most of the valuable space in the tall glass, space that could have been used for a little extra vodka. The tomato juice was weak, ugly red, and the liberal dose of Worcester sauce served only to transform the red into rust, another waste of space that would have been better used for a bit of vodka. Ah, oh, what the fuck, he thought, and ordered a double shot of Stolly. Passe, yes, but it would likely do the trick, and without the damn superfluous blood-red tomato juice and obscene green bean garnishes. He shoved the tall glass across the bar with a little too much emphasis, and the remaining rusty red liquid spilled onto the bar, splashing onto the immaculate white sleeve of his best, and only, dress shirt. Oh, fuck me, he thought as he eyed the red stain on his sleeve. And then, it came to him. Oh, so quickly, so easily, so obscenely. William knew exactly what he should do. He straightened his shoulders, drank the double vodka, and honed his plan. He smiled at the hooker who sat, legs crossed, on one of the high back leather chairs at the bar. Well, she was obviously out of her league, uncomfortable in this pretentious bar. Her skirt was far too short, and her fake fingernails too long. She was thin, 
possibly from some type of drug use. But that wasn't the problem, he thought. He would wear surgical gloves if need be. He sized her up. Hmm. She would do, he thought. She'd do nicely. William chatted up the hooker with a charm he didn't know he still possessed. Soon, they were headed towards his French Quarter apartment, and he held her arm lightly, as a gentleman would do. Angel couldn't believe her luck. She hadn't really thought she would find a John in the fancy bar on Julia Street, but she was desperate and would have tried just about anything for money. The rent was a week past due, and she hadn't had any blow in three days. She would do anything, well, just about anything. Now, here she was, clicking her way down Chartres Street in her high-heeled shoes. This Almost handsome, stranger steering her lightly into the walkway between two big houses. She'd hit the jackpot, she thought, as the stranger with a soft touch guided her into the cobblestone courtyard, flanked on either side by old slave quarters. Well, maybe he wasn't big house rich, but he still had to have money, as did anyone who could afford to live in the French Quarter. She felt a tremendous sense of relief as they climbed the wrought iron stairs to the second floor. Oh, she'd be able to pay her rent after all, and perhaps have enough cash left over for a little partying. It would be a productive night, she thought, relieved and ready for whatever may come. At least, she thought she was ready. William opened the French doors to his apartment and art studio. He'd lived in the upstairs slave quarter for more than ten years, and his rich patroness, who lived in the front house, hadn't the heart, or perhaps couldn't be bothered, to raise his rent. His living quarters would be considered lavish by most, and certainly expansive, consuming most of the upstairs building flanking the left side of the huge, opulent courtyard. The buildings on the right were only used for storage. He had the privacy he needed for his plan. He gestured his hooker friend toward the sofa and found the last bottle of wine hiding in the cupboard. He poured the red liquid into two crystal wine glasses purchased from Adler's on Canal Street when the city was affluent, as he had been. His guest was impressed. Well, let's let her enjoy herself a bit while she can, he thought, and smiled. He refilled her glass having barely touched his drink. Oh, she should know better, being in her line of work, William mused. She should know never to let her guard down, especially when working. She sighed and rested her head against the green velvet throw pillow. Her eyes closed. Angel awoke to find her hands bound to the headboard. Her blouse had been removed, but she was otherwise fully dressed. There was a dull burning sensation on her forearm, where William had sliced into her flesh, draining what he could collect of her blood. It was a start, he thought, but he would need more. Angel began to sob. Let me go, she tried to scream, but her throat was so parched she only managed a croak. Oh, the classic scene in every slasher film. William thought with a sick, sardonic smile. What did you do to me? Angel managed to ask. She knew she was in trouble. Was her John one of those ridiculous pseudo-vampires who roamed the city, thinking themselves ageless if they sipped a few drops of blood mixed in with their expensive Chardonnay? Well, she instinctively knew this was different from a one-night vampire bloodlet. This felt heavy and morose, and for the first time in her somewhat successful career as a hooker, Angel was frightened. She was terrified. Shut up, the John demanded as he plastered a piece of duct tape over Angel's dry, cracked lips. It was dark in the large, lush room which had served as William's guest room when he'd been popular enough to warrant overnight visitors. The room had sat empty for months now, and, although somewhat musty, 
It would be his guest's new home, at least for as long as he could bleed her. William hadn't really thought past that. The first letting had been comparatively easy. It had gone well. He simply cut the hooker's arm deeply enough to elicit a nice flow of blood and captured it as well as he could in another clean, crystal wine glass. He gleaned almost an inch of thick burgundy blood and carried it devoutly into his studio. He would paint tomorrow. He would create paintings that would come alive in depth and color, and, of course, in content. Well, he wasted half an inch of the burgundy blood, trying to paint it directly onto his canvas. It was beautiful for the first five or ten minutes, but then turned an ugly, rusty brown upon extended exposure to oxygen. He spent most of that day mixing the remainder of the blood in the wine glasses with acrylic colors he'd always used, and began to panic when his efforts depleted the red liquid in the glass. He didn't really want to spend his time today bleeding the girl in his guest room, William was more than a little irked that this morning had been spent in the trivial task of having to feed the girl and then going to Walgreens to purchase adult diapers and protein drinks. He sighed as he mixed the last of the precious liquid with a lipstick red from one of his hundreds of acrylic tubes, adding only the tiniest smidgen of blue bird purple. As soon as the pigments began to mingle, William knew he had succeeded. Ah, the concoction was beautiful, and it glided onto the canvas like melted butter. He named his new color Blood Red. The first painting was a reclining nude, her arms stretched back over her head. Of course, he didn't paint the chains that held her arms at length. Neither did he paint the face of his captive. He painted her bare chest and turned head. Her thin arms extended, her body twisted in what might be misinterpreted as ecstasy. It reminded William of Bernini's Ecstasy of St. Teresa, a face of pleasure and pain, or perhaps Joan of Arc at the post as she cast her eyes toward the heavens and embraced the flames. "'What's your name?' he asked the hooker, chained to the bed. He'd lower the chains so she would bleed better. He'd been using her arms as a matter of convenience. Fuck you, Angel managed to whisper. Hmm. Time for dinner, he said, ignoring her remark. Soup okay? He asked as he sat a tray on the end table next to the bed. He unlocked the chain holding her right wrist and allowed her to eat and drink to her content. He tried to feed her high-protein meals and, at first, she'd eaten what he proffered. Today, she lay silent and still on the vinyl-covered bed. It had taken her a while, but she'd finally figured out his game. Oh, he was worse than a pervert. He was going to bleed her dry, and then what? Kill her? William had begun to wonder the same thing. Lately, she'd become difficult to bleed from the arms and hands. He'd carefully avoided any veins, not wanting a complete bleed-out in one cut. Should he start on the legs now? And then, well, what? Please, just let me go. I won't tell anyone about you. Please, she begged. Oh, God. How many times have we heard that in a bad movie? William said, and stifled a laugh. This is real life, man. God, I'm scared. I'm telling you the truth. I'll never say a word. Just let me go. Angel pleaded. I'll let you go when we're done, William promised. Now, eat your soup. Maybe tomorrow, if you're good. Angel ate the soup. His energy coursed through her weakened body, and she thought maybe, just maybe, there was a way out of this nightmare. She knew that she was being bled, but she had no idea why, she wasn't sure how much longer she'd be of use to this madman. His painting was done. It was near perfect. He would do another, and another. He worked with an energy he hadn't had since he was a young, successful artist. One destined for greatness, one critic had written in the, well, 
whatever magazine. That had been almost ten years ago. He'd somehow slipped out of grace during those years of drinking and partying and having every woman he wanted. He'd forgotten how to paint. His offering stayed unsold, and he was all but ostracized from the big art events around town. Yeah, well, well that's going to change, he thought. They've never seen anything like this. He'd call his new show Ecstasy. So William bled Angel for his next painting. He carefully mixed blood and paints and began his next piece. He'd all but begged Joshua for one more chance and had taken his first piece, entitled Angel, to the gallery in an effort to persuade his friend for space. Joshua had studied the painting for less than a minute and had acquiesced. William would have his show in two months and open on white linen night. Angel had stopped eating, and she stopped peeing into the diaper that he'd provided for her. She'd apparently stopped all bodily functions with the exceptions of sleeping and breathing. It was obvious to William that he would soon need another source. So he dug a makeshift grave in the flowerbed that sprouted gardenias and jasmine in the back corner of the courtyard, and unceremoniously dumped Angel and her meagre belongings into the hole. He wasn't sure if she completely stopped breathing. He didn't want to know. He was manic, his mind laser-focused on her replacement. That shouldn't be too difficult, he thought. There were plenty of two-bit hookers in New Orleans. Girls just trying to get by. Girls who were lost to the underbelly of the city. Stray cats prowling the night. Angel felt the soft earth hitting her face her torso, her legs. She lay still, her breath shallow. Her purse lay over her face, providing an inch or so of breathing space, and the dirt of the flowerbed was soft and porous. William was in a hurry, and covered the body with about a foot of loose soil. He dampened it with his foot, and left her there, either dead or surely dying. When Angel heard his footsteps fade, she whirled a single finger to burrow upward into the loose soil. She poked through the dirt and saw a dim remnant of daylight filtering through the crumbling soil. Fresh, sweet air trickled into her tomb. She breathed, but she lay still. She waited. She watched the last of the winter sun fade through the tiny hole. Darkness enveloped her, and when she finally saw the dim light from the man's apartment go dark, she slowly began to claw. The dirt gave way fairly easily, and she climbed out of the shallow grave. Laying motionless under the cold, damp earth for six hours had given Angel plenty of time to think. She decided not to run to the police. They would lightly sigh and take a report, but simply chalk the incident up to the hazards of being a hooker. No, oh, instead Angel had hatched a plan, and that plan was what gave her the strength she needed to rise from her grave. Angel stood, her stiff legs threatening to buckle. She drank greedily from the faucet over the sink in the laundry room, and felt her legs steady a bit. Watching the windows of the man's apartment, she washed herself, careful not to make a sound, managing to remove most of the residual soil from her body. She carefully navigated her way through the maze of greenery and onto the cobblestone courtyard. She quickened her barefoot pace through the walkway and saw the wrought iron gate that led to Chartres Street. She half walked, half ran the blocks to her Bywater studio, uncovered the key from its hiding place and fell onto her bed. She'd been held and bled for exactly two weeks. The middle-aged landlady, Alma, took one look at Angel and almost screamed. Alma had climbed the narrow stairs to the second floor apartment with every intention of chastising her young tenant about the late rent payment, but after seeing the girl and hearing the horrific count of Angel's two-week absence, Alma gently chided the child for not going to the hospital. She cleaned and dressed Angel's wounds as well as she could. And for the next few weeks, 
She fed her young tenant healthy stews and juices and sat at her bedside. Alma insisted Angel stay in bed and not worry about the rent. It's my gift to you, Alma insisted. Angel cried from relief and from joy. It was the first gift she'd ever received. William rented a room and gave the front desk clerk a hundred dollar bill for the room and another hundred for his uh, discretion. It was an older hotel in the back section of the quarter, and one of the few that was not blanketed with the eyes of security cameras. The older man dressed in black who opened the front door doubled as a bellman and security guard. It was not unusual for rooms to be rented by the hour or two. The desk clerk handed the bellman one of his crisp bills, keeping the other for himself, and then went back to surfing the internet on the hotel computer. Room key in hand, William headed to the hotel bar. He ordered a vodka on the rocks and waited. He didn't have to wait very long. So, what's your name? William asked the petite blonde who'd been eyeing him for at least ten minutes. Bluebird. The blonde answered sincerely. Cut the crap, William said as he handed her the gin gimlet for which she'd asked. Diane, the hooker answered. Not that it's any of your business, but my name's Diane. Well, if it's okay with you, I'd uh, like to get to know you a little better. I sort of like knowing who I take into my bed, if you know what I mean. William sipped his vodka and managed to smile just enough to seem genuine. He wanted to be a little bit more certain that she was a loner, as were most of the working girls. I, um, I don't have any diseases, if that's what you mean, she answered. Neither do I, William said. He had no idea if he had any diseases or not. He was, after all, New Orleans. Are you from here? William asked once again attempting innocent conversation. No, uh, Mobile. We've been here six months. <laughs> you want to know my shoe size too? Diane's irritation raised a red flag for William, and he realized he should back off. He began telling her about his job and how he needed another three accounts before he could return to Memphis. He realized then that he was a fluent liar. Oh, you're a good-looking guy. Diane noted. Why would you need to pay for sex? She asked. Now you're the one that's getting personal, William quipped. Let's just say I'm into some things that the girls I know in Memphis can't appreciate. So, want to come with me or not? He asked, pretending to be a tiny bit annoyed. Sure, Diane said. Let's go. It's 200 an hour. 100 more for kinky stuff. William was pretty certain she'd never gotten over a hundred in her life, but said, Two hundred it is. He didn't want to scare her off. Well, Diane proved to be more savvy than Angel. She refused the wine William offered, but acquiesced to the handcuffs after counting the three hundred dollars and stuffing the crisp bills into her cheap bag. She'd seen pretty much everything in the six months she'd hooked in New Orleans, and being handcuffed to a bed was comparatively vanilla pulled out the large syringe she'd obtained from the medical supply place on Tulane. Whoa, wait a minute, what's that? Diane demanded. Shut up and be still. I'm just going to draw some blood. Now, we can do it the hard way and the easy way. Diane was not in a position to argue and let her left arm be loosened from the cuff. The man obviously had no prior experience in drawing blood, and after four failed attempts, he finally hit a good vein. The large syringe filled quickly. He undid the remaining locks and, without saying a word, she put her shirt back on and left, clutching her bag to her chest. It was 2am, on a weeknight, and the streets of the quarter were hollow and empty, save for the homeless man on the corner. She called for an Uber, but no one responded, so she walked hurriedly to her apartment on St. Claude, trying to forget this night and silently promising herself to get a real job. Uh, 
Uh, William had enough supply now to finish his final works for the gallery. His last piece, he thought, was his masterpiece. A blonde woman, body supine, one arm sheltering her forehead, the other extended towards something outside the canvas. At first glance, laying upon what looked to be a blood-red velvet-covered bed. Upon a more careful inspection of the painting, however, one began to question whether she lay enveloped in red velvet or in her own blood. It was the perfect visual illusion, and of this William was extraordinarily proud. It was his pièce de résistance. And Joseph agreed. This show would no doubt be divine, absolutely breathtaking. Angel had stayed alive in her grave by thinking about the revenge she would exact upon her kidnapper. She would haunt him, she thought. She would drug the vodka he kept in the freezer. She would enter his bedroom at night, stand over him, and then disappear into the night. A shadow. A ghost. She would drive him insane, haunting him until he cut his wrists or blew his head off with a gun. She knew he had one. He threatened her with it often enough. He'd almost robbed her of her life. But she was alive, and for that she was grateful. But she could never forget those horrific two weeks he kept her prisoner, chained and cut at will, his personal blood bank. In the weeks that followed her escape from the madman's grasp, she changed her plans. She hadn't wanted a chance that the arsehole would check her last resting place, she thought he was too much of a coward, but she had to be certain. She'd been out one evening, one of the first that Alma had allowed her out alone, and she'd seen him. She stood stock still, staring across the park until he had seen her. Once she was certain, once they'd locked eyes, she found her way down Frenchman Street and disappeared into one of the side streets. Well, he tried to follow her, to prove to himself that it was a simple case of mistaken identity, but she had escaped him easily this time. He must have been mistaken, he told himself. He had to have been mistaken. Within a month or so, Angel was well enough to attend White Linen Night, a huge event in the always eventful city. It was a night of snow-white fashion and gallery crawls, especially on St. Claude and in the warehouse district. Julia Street was particularly awash in white. The gallery was packed. William charmed his guests, all of whom were gushing with compliments and accolades. His broad smile was as white as his collarless linen shirt. He was a striking figure, posing in front of one of his blood-red paintings, a vision in white shirt and trousers. Absolutely stunning. He shook hands, smiled, quipped, and accepted the exorbitant praise of his patrons. Across the snow-white sea of bodies, William saw the girl who had evaded him that day on Frenchman Street. Again, she stood motionless, not fawning over his paintings as were so many, but staring across the room directly at him. He moved gracefully through his admirers and weaved his way across to the crowded room, adamant that he would not lose sight of this woman again. He had to know that she was simply a look-alike, not a ghost. No one noticed when the slight, dark-haired woman in white stood directly in front of William, smiling wanly. No one noticed when she drew the knife from her white glove and shoved it with all her might into William's gut. No one saw her twist it left and right, and then withdraw it and slip it back into the glove she held so demurely. She easily made her way through the white cloud of the crowd and out of the door. She was already in another gallery on the block by the time William collapsed onto the floor, holding his hands over the blood-red stain that crawled over his white shirt and trousers. An ambulance was called. William was rushed to the Grace of God Hospital on Canal Street, where surgeons and the ER staff worked for over 12 hours on the man who had lost so much blood. It was touch and go. The gallery sold every one of his paintings within two hours. Should William die, his paintings would double in price within the day. 
Should he survive, William would be a very rich man. And this was good news for, as he did indeed survive, thanks to the skilled surgeons who pieced his stomach back together. It was, in fact, excellent news, for William would need lots of money to pay for his medical care, the cost of which would quickly cancel out any proceeds from the sale of his paintings. William had become painfully thin. His clothing sagged in a most unbecoming manner. He had survived the vicious and unprovoked attack, but his stomach had been severely and irreparably damaged. He had a difficult, if not impossible, time ingesting enough nutrients to sustain him, and consequently he was severely anemic. Yes, the artist would require extensive and continued treatment for the remainder of his life. Who doesn't love a good tale of revenge every now and again? Oh yes indeed. Well, we can't say he didn't have it coming to him, can we? What a cheeky little bugger he was. Just desserts a yeah, damn right. Well, did you like that one? Another one from Dr. Creepin's Vault, the subreddit I set up so you could share your story with me and I could read them all back to you. Let me know what you thought in the comments section below. And even though I'm away on holiday at the moment, I'm in Turkey, back into uh, my old country, I will do my best to uh, join in the conversation. Well. Everything back to normal next week, and the stories will keep flowing. Not sure there'll be one on Sunday this week as I'll be travelling, but I will be back with you as normal next week on Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Till then, my dear friends, sweet dreams and bye-bye. Thank you so much for choosing to spend your time listening to me. Now, if you enjoyed the Dr. Creepin experience, then come find me on Facebook. Come chat with me on Twitter. Listen to the background music and download it if you like on SoundCloud. Drop by the store, pick up a t-shirt. And, importantly, if you've got a story you'd like me to read, send it to Dr. Creepin's Vault, the subreddit I set up so that I could read your stories. Now... Looking forward to seeing you all again real soon, so come check me out, okay? <laughs>